picture two, seeing the traces. With the aid of the sutras, you gain understanding. Through study of the teachings, you find traces. You see clearly the many vessels are all one metal, and the ten thousand things are all yourself. But if you do not distinguish correct from incorrect, how will you recognize true from false? Since you have yet to pass through that gate, only tentatively have you seen the traces. By the water and under the trees, tracks thick and fast. In the sweet grasses, thick with growth. Did you see it, or did you not? But even in the depths of the deepest mountains, how could it hide from others? Its snout turned to the sky. Determination deep. In the mountains, your efforts bear fruit. Tracks. How gratifying to see a sign. This is a stage where, after searching for the ox deep in the mountains, you finally come across its tracks. First, we must study the sutras and ponder the records left by the teachers of the past in order to determine where our own nature is. Sometimes you hear it said that Zen monks do not have to read books or to study. When did this misleading idea get started? It's ridiculous to think that this could possibly be true. We say Zen is a separate transmission outside the scriptures, but it is only because there is a teaching that there is something transmitted, separate from it. If there were no teaching necessary in the first place, you could not speak of a transmission separate from it. If we do not first study the sutras and ponder the records of the ancients, we will end up going off in the wrong direction altogether. The ancient teachers engaged in all branches of scholarship and studied all there was to study. 
but just through scholarship alone. They were not able to settle what was bothering them. It was then that they turned to Zen. That is why their Zen had real power and dynamism. If you have no understanding of Buddhism, no knowledge of the words of the Dharma, it does not matter how many years you sit, your meditation will all be futile. Both the fifth patriarch and the sixth patriarch attained their Zen through the Diamond Sutra. Rinzai Zenji came to Zen after thoroughly studying the Flower Garland Sutra. Heikuan writes in his autobiography that he read the Lotus Sutra when he was young but threw it away laughing. If this is the king of all sutras, then even popular novels or storybooks or puppet plays can be king of all sutras. Years later, when he had taken over a temple, he re-read the Lotus Sutra. Reading the sutra till late one night, he heard the crick crick of a cricket from under the floorboards and was suddenly enlightened to it as the wonderful embodiment of the lotus. He cried out in a great voice, This wonderful sutra, how could I have been so prejudiced till now and rejected it out of hand? In the Lotus Sutra, it is written, Daily duties and attending to work is nothing other than true reality. When we do business or farm or do temple work or engage in politics and economics, all this is the Buddha Dharma. Again it is written, All things now in the three worlds are my possession. All sentient beings within them are my children. To grow in comprehension of these words is what is meant by with the aid of the sutras, you gain understanding. In the Flower Garland Sutra, it is written, The grass and trees, the land and the earth, are all Buddha. In the Nirvana Sutra, it is written, All sentient beings, whatever, possess Buddha nature. In the Diamond Sutra, rouse the mind which resides nowhere.
all of these are none other than the immaculate embodiment of Zen. All express the Buddha mind just as it is. If without studying the sutras, you merely sit in zazen and get swell-headed because you've passed some koans or even, heaven forbid, have had satori and received permission to teach, you will become a zen devil. With the aid of the sutras you gain understanding and through study of the teachings, you find traces. So it is written. Through the pointers left behind by the ancient teachers, we catch sight of the ox's traces. We catch sight of the footprints of the ox called the heart-mind. You see clearly the many vessels are all one metal and the 10,000 things are all yourself. In the hardware store, there are pots and pans and row after row of utensils all made of metal though they are all shapes and sizes, they are all made of the same metal. In this world, there are innumerable things of every kind and variety, but we know that they are all reducible to the same elements. The 10,000 things are all this one body of mine. When you realise this for the first time, you become heaven and earth and the universe. You become all things in their infinite number and variety. You bodily realise that all the 10,000 things, just as they are, are all you, yourself. It is written, I am of the same root as all heaven and earth. I am one body with the 10,000 things. Those are splendid words. It is indeed just as they say. But it won't do if you come to this understanding only through the sutras. 
that is merely understanding gain from reading the words of the teachings. It is not Kensho, seeing one's true nature. It does not mean that you have actually seen the ox. All it means is that you have found the tracks. But if you do not distinguish correct from incorrect, how will you recognize true from false? So now you know what the samadhi of mu, of no thing, of no, is. But that is still just a trace. You cannot call it Kensho, your true nature, unless, to use the words of Rinzai Osho, you have realized true insight, out of which comes the dynamic for distinguishing Buddha from devil. If you cannot recognize the difference between correct and incorrect, you will not be able to distinguish true from false. If all you can talk about is the samadhi of Mu, in which all things are just Mu, no thing, you haven't yet got the real thing. You cannot say that you have really seen the ox until you get that power by which, in the leap of a spark, you separate black from white. In a flash of lightning, you discern stop from start. Since you have yet to pass through that gate, only tentatively have you seen the traces. At this point, we really still cannot say that you are inside. You are still an outsider beyond the gate. For this reason, this provisional stage of seeing the traces has been created. You think you have gradually gotten settled into the Samadhi of Mu, but you still cannot recognize correct from incorrect, distinguish true from false, You have been saying moo, moo, over and over, but you haven't the slightest idea if this is the right way or the wrong way. This is still just seeing the traces, and for this, Rinzai Osho has written a verse. 
By the water and under the trees, there are tracks thick and fast. In search of the ox, you entered the mountains and there, where you reached the clear waters of a running stream, in a thick cedar forest, you came upon the tracks of the ox, did you not? This is the place of the willows are steeped with cannon's wondrous form. The whispering pines teach the salvation of sentient beings. An old pine speaks intrinsic wisdom and a mysterious bird toys with truth. The sound of the wind in the pines. This too is a trace of the ox, is it not? The call of the nightingale. This too is a trace of the ox, is it not? The streams, the birds, the trees and the forest are all chanting Buddha, chanting Dharma, chanting Sangha. Everything you see, everything you hear, each and every one is a manifestation of the heart-mind. There is nothing which is not a trace of the ox. An ancient verse runs. The splashing of the brook is the eloquence of the Buddha. Are not the mountains in colour, the pure Buddha body? In the sweet grasses, thick with growth, did you see it, or did you not? The sweet grasses here refer to the sutras which expound Buddha nature, and the recorded sayings of the ancients which point to Zen. There are in fact enough such books to make a mountain Thick with growth here means that those grasses are full and plentiful. Those grasses, still wet with dew, are endlessly lush and profuse. In those sweet grasses, in everything you see and in everything you hear, There is nothing which does not reveal Buddha nature. Are they not all traces of the ox? And you, have you seen it? Have you heard it?
But even in the depths of the deepest mountains, how could it hide from others its snout turned to the sky? Despite the fact that there are so many traces of the ox everywhere, still you haven't seen it. This is because you are stuck in the weeds of self-delusion. The thickets of self-delusion are choked with overgrowth. It does not matter how much you seek, how much you search, Always you are buried under a mountain of self-delusion. Choked with the weeds of mistaken thinking. With the weeds of intellectualization. There is no way you can find the ox. But it is not as sad as all that. How could it hide from others its snout turn to the sky, says the verse. So long as you have seen the traces of the ox, there is no way that the ox can hide its snout, that nose lifted to the sky. Sometime or other, it will show that snout to everyone. So things are not really so sad after all. If you've seen the tracks, then do not throw down your staff in frustration and call it quits. Follow up the tracks until you finally catch it. So long as you do not give up that affirmation of your vow, so long as you do not break your staff in frustration, for certain you will be able to catch the ox. Don't get discouraged. No matter what, you must summon up that determination. Once more push on up that mountain. Determination deep, in the mountains your efforts bear fruit. Tracks, how gratifying to see a sign. You've been meditating morning and night. As a result, regardless of what you may think, your meditation has turned into the tracks of the ox. Up until now, it's as if it had no connection with you. But now you are starting to see that this moo, this meditation on no thing, is your own moo. It has turned into the traces of the ox. 
your own heart-mind. Somehow, it has settled into you. Remember, if you persevere day and night without break, then just one lighting of the candle of the Dharma is at once to attain it. Do not let those tracks out of sight wherever you go. Ponder them when you are out and about, when you are out doing work. If you persevere without break through the day, through the night, then finally you are going to catch one brute of an ox. Search to the very limits of your uncertain heart. There, the tracks of the long lost ox. Well, you seem to have found the ox's tracks, but now, no matter what you do, no matter how far you go, all you find are traces. There's no sign even of the ox's tail. You haven't spotted even the ox's tail, let alone the snout pointed up at the sky. You say to yourself, no matter how many times I go into meditation, I just get wrung out by the bell. I give up. The very idea of meditating disgusts you. You didn't think it would come to this. You are completely disgusted. This is an endurance contest, a test of patience. Who's going to give in first? There's nothing to do but play the fool and just as always, go out and search for the tracks of the lost ox. Now, with that attitude, Go get that ox.